I now call to order this special meeting of the Anchorage Assembly. It is Friday, January 28, 2022. We are noticed from 3.30 to 4 p.m. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Madam Chair. Mr. Waddleton. Here. Ms. Allard. Ms. Allard, are you on the phone? Mr. Peterson. Present. Mr. Rivera. Present. Ms. Kennedy. Here. Ms. LaFrance. Here. Mr. Thompson. Here. Ms. Zolotel. Here. Mr. Dunbar. Here. Mr. Perez Verdia. Here. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mr. Weddleton, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Constant, would you read the land acknowledgement, please? Yes. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement recognizing the indigenous people of a place. It's a public gesture of appreciation for the past and present indigenous stewardship of the lands that we now occupy. It's an actionable statement that marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. The Anchorage Assembly would like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Denina Athabascans. For thousands of years, the Denina have been and continue to be stewards of this land. It is with gratitude and respect that we recognize the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspectives of the Upper Cook Inlet Denina. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Before we move on to our one item of business, I will go now to Ms. Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think you can hear me loud and clear on the new speakers and through the new sound system in the uh, in room 155. Um, this project has been a long time coming, and obviously we still have a few little glitches here that we're trying to work out. But you can see you have um, wireless microphones at each station. And then we have, instead of the projectors that we used to have, we now have large screen TVs. And Desiree, could you hit um, mine? And so we will be able to display um, information for you on the screens. There's also another screen back in the back for the audience, so they will be seeing the same thing. I know sometimes it's been difficult for people in the back to either hear or see, and um, now they will be able to both see and hear. So um, I, I want to thank people like um, um, Assemblymember Felix Rivera, John Weddleton. They've been behind this. Um, I think we started it long ago when you were both chair and vice chair, and then. Our biggest thanks to me goes to um, Desiree Camacho, who was your project lead and who has just really worked really hard on this project. And then two people, I know there's a whole team from IT, but um, Dan Barnhart was the project manager, and then Mariah Westmoreland, who is um, the assemblies. She assists you at all of your assembly meetings. Is she here? There she is. Um, so Mariah is here too to help us with troubleshooting. So I just hope you know it's just gonna keep getting better after this. Desiree, did I forget anything? No, I don't think so. This is our soft opening. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Thank you, Ms. Jones, and thank you, Mr. Rivera and Mr. Weddleton, Ms. Camacho. Mr. Barnhart and Ms. Westmoreland for your work. Um, this is great and um, thank you all very much for making this a reality. So we have one item 
of business on our agenda. We now have before us item 4A, Assembly Action on Mayoral Veto of AO 2021-117 as amended, an ordinance of the Anchorage Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code Chapter 2.30, Rules of Procedure for Assembly to codify additional rules of procedure for the Assembly and presiding officer to promote the efficient, safe, and orderly conduct of assembly business from the special assembly meeting of January 19, 2022. What is the will of the body? Move to override. Second. A motion has been made to override the mayoral veto. It has been made by Mr. Constant and seconded by Mr. Rivera. Um, before I move through the queue, I want to just verify that we have the live stream up. The live stream, the video is up, but the audio is not working quite right because your mics are not picking you up. We do have um, a separate recorder, so we can make sure that the recording of the meeting gets uploaded after. But we're going back to 2018 for that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Camacho. Mr. Constant? Thank you. Um, I am going to put a few comments into the record. Uh, first, this omnibus ordinance, AO 2021 117, is intended to make necessary updates and clarifications to the numerous code provisions that govern assembly meetings and procedures. The memorandum submitted with the ordinance noted its broad goals. The attached ordinance intends to the, attends to the facts that one, some of the assembly's customary practices, such as those relating to immediate reconsideration of an item, are addressed only in Robert's rules and not in municipal code. Two, some of the rules and nomenclature contained in Robert's rules of order newly revised depart from traditional assembly practice. And three, that further codification of the assembly's rules of procedure in municipal code can reduce confusion and provide greater clarity to the public. The ordinance cleans up several contradictions, makes the assembly's rules more transparent and user friendly, and the vast majority of its necessary updates are non-controversial. Of note, among the several changes adopted in the ordinance is a provision that expands the right of the mayor to call on municipal staff during assembly debate. The mayor raised three concerns in his veto. It's three provisions of a 16 page ordinance. A, distracting and dangerous items. The first is that codifying a prohibition on the bringing of, quote, dangerous or distracting items into the chamber, if they're, quote, being used to create an actual disturbance, could somehow interfere with Alaska Statute 29.35.145. That concern is unwarranted. First, the provisions in AO 2021-117 is broader in scope than the state law provision. It permits a response if members of the public attempt to bring into assembly chambers noisy devices, noxious materials, or signs that block public view. Second, to the extent that there is any conflict with the state law, everyone recognizes that AS 29.35.145 trumps local law, and local law must be applied in accordance with the state law provision. AO 2021-117 does not require and will not result in the municipality violating state law. B. Ability of the assembly to control its meetings. Second, the mayor expresses his belief that the presiding officer, officer of the assembly cannot give instructions to municipal security contractors while presiding over assembly meetings, or perhaps that the presiding officer may only do so subject to the mayor's consent or non-objection. That view is novel. No prior mayor has ever expressed it, and it's entirely inconsistent with the municipality's actual practices from 1975 to 2021. It cannot be squared with the Charter's vesting of legislative power in the Assembly, or with the Charter's command that the Assembly determines its own rules and order of business, runs its own meetings, that the meetings are overseen by a presiding officer elected from the Assembly. The Mayor's provision or position involves significant overreach, a novel theory of expanded executive power, and result in an untenable erosion of the ability of the Assembly to conduct its business. We recognize that the branches have an ongoing disagreement on this point. That disagreement should not prevent the assembly from clarifying the meaning of a motion to lay on the table or from refining the order of business at a regular or special assembly meeting. It should not preclude the body from enacting 
AO 2021-117 generally. C, silent testimony. Last, the mayor's veto message also addresses a provision in the ordinance designed to expedite assembly business and public testimony when persons wish in public to stand in silence. The assembly recognizes that silent protest is a form of expression that is rightly recognized under the First Amendment. That assembly, the assembly respects silent protest. The assembly also recognizes that as a leading municipal law treatise puts it, quote, a city council meeting is a governmental process with a governmental purpose. The council has an agenda to be addressed and dealt with. Public forum or not, the usual First Amendment antipathy to content-oriented control of speech cannot be imported into the council's chambers intact. Therefore, in dealing with agenda items, the council does not violate the First Amendment when it restricts public speakers to the subject at hand, and while a speaker may not be stopped from speaking because the moderator disagrees with the viewpoint he is expressing, it certainly may stop a speaker if the speaker's speech becomes irrelevant or repetitious. Therefore, a court has held, for instance, that three-minute time limit allowed to each public speaker did not violate a meeting attendee's First Amendment right to speech because the meeting was a governmental process with a governmental purpose and an agenda to be addressed. That's from a forum analysis, time, place, and manner restrictions, limited public forum, 7 McQuillan Municipal Corporations, part 24, part 434, third edition. And further, a city may regulate the non-communicative aspects of protected speech so long as there's a rational basis for the regulation and the impingement on the right of free speech is reasonable. That's 24. Part 431, Forum Analysis, Time, Place, and Manner Restrictions, 7 McQuillan Municipal Corporations, 24, 431, Third Edition. The code provision addressed to silent testimony was addressed to the non-communicative aspects of silent protest. The provision permits silent protest and allows it to continue for a speaker's full three minutes, but the provision also aimed at expediting the, expediting the assembly's business and facilitating more public testimony, which are valid aims. Still. We appreciate the invitation in the mayor's veto message to review his concerns and work with him. We would welcome a collaboration between the assembly branch and the legislative branch. To that end, we would ask assembly council and the department of law to work together on how to better address the subject under concern, first amendment considerations. In the meantime, the provision at issue does not require the assembly to take additional testimony during another during another speaker's silence, and silent protests during public testimony has to date been exceedingly rare. The chair is not presentingly, is not presentingly, present intending, or presently intending, notwithstanding changes to AMC 230.055B made by the ordinance to change the manner in which silent protest has historically been received. So, AO 2021-117 can be enacted and generally made operative while additional legal review of this section occurs. The assembly is certainly willing to revisit the provision in a future ordinance if that is the recommendation from the Department of Law and Assembly Council. I urge you to override this veto. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Next in the queue is Ms. Ms. Kennedy, followed by Mr. Weddleton. Ms. Kennedy? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the um, opportunity to oppose uh, what was just recently spoken. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, and if other folks on the phone could please uh, mute. We can hear you, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that there was a comment that this is uh, user-friendly. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the I think even the title of this particular ordinance and the reason why I opposed it to begin with was because it actually says to codify additional rules of procedure for the assembly and the presiding officer. And actually what the vast majority of this does is it tries to, it's really directed at the public. It tries to control the actions, the beliefs, the opinions, uh, the testimony of the public. And that's where I find fault in the majority of this entire ordinance. Um, it's directed in the public and such that it tells them what they, well, it doesn't tell them specifically, but it could potentially um, move, move them out of the uh, assembly chambers for what they wear, what they say on a sign. Uh, we don't need all these items, which really does open up the assembly to lawsuits on grounds of violating First Amendment rights Free, free speech, freedom of expression, freedom to petition, and there's potentially others. So um, the vast majority of this does not serve the assembly. It 
it tries to control the conduct of the public. And that's not what we're about. The public has the right to say what they need to say. And the bottom line for me, though, is that this should remain vetoed because we really can work on a document that is, is much better, even if we just stuck with the very first line of Section E that says, the chair shall have the authority to make rulings subject to being overruled by vote of the assembly. So even though you've gone through this laundry list of things that you don't want the public to do, the bottom line is anytime a chair, whoever that might be, decides that somebody has violated this laundry list of items, then we would have the ability as, or the whole assembly would have the ability to overrule that ruling. So what we do with having this list is we, we actually antagonize the public and we insult them. And that's what I take the most issue with, is that this just seems like a vindictive way of getting back at a few people. Maybe it even has something to do with the ongoing argument with the administration, I don't know. But this doesn't serve the public. And I think there are better ways for us to be able to handle what happens in the chambers. I know currently the chair does her best to try to deal with people that are out of sorts and the police are there to help. So it seems to be working, but you can never control somebody from the public coming in just because you have decided to put a list together of all these different things that they can or can't do. So I would suggest that we allow this uh, for the time being to just cool down, cool off, uh, let it remain vetoed. And we will just continue to operate with the chair basically always having the ability to make a ruling with that ruling always having the ability to be subjected to an overrule by a vote of the assembly. So I would encourage even those that voted for this to begin with to maybe see a way clearer at this point that serves the public better and stop some of the argumentation that I see going on and uh, just allows this uh, ordinance to remain vetoed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Mr. Weddleton? Before that point of order, I would like to make a motion to extend by 10 minutes. This says four, that says 430. Just for the purposes of good order, I'm gonna ask that we make a motion to extend. So motion is on the floor made by Mr. Constant to extend to 410 and seconded by Ms. Mr. Weddleton, did you second? Uh, yeah. Um, any opposition to extending to 410? Seeing no opposition, we are extended until 4.10. Mr. Weddleton? Well, thanks. You know, I, I had viewed this from the start, that we did this at the request of the mayor. I mean, some months ago, the mayor asked, you know, how would I know what your procedures are? How, do, how would anyone know these things? So this came together, and I, I saw it as a response to that. So uh, we don't need it. I mean, we can operate like we've been operating. This just kind of spells out it. And, and, and like what Ms. Kennedy's points, I would say the vast majority of it is how do we run our meetings amongst ourselves? There's very little in here that addresses the public. And certainly there, there's not really changes in what we've historically done. So if we don't override, if we, um, if we don't override it, then we're essentially the same place we were before except for two things. One is the provision where we can end the public hearing by postponing indefinitely. And I think that's valuable and I didn't see objection to that. And then the other one regarded security guards. And I thought that was interesting that it goes all the way back to um, James Madison. I don't think he's worried about securities, but, um, you know, and that's easily handled. I mean, we should just hire our own security guards. That's easy to just adjust the budget in the first quarter or sooner. We can adjust the budget at any time. Take the money the mayor is spending on security, and we hire them, and we put it towards this. So super easy to fix that. Um, and we do that without overriding. Um, on the other hand, I think Mr. Kant is right. Should we override? We should, it's not very hard to amend this. I think you have a one page amendment to address the issues that the mayor brought up. I mean, one is um, just that a line, we can't override state law. I mean, that's a given throughout the code, but if it wants to be obvious, we can make that obvious. Um, we can say security guards that we hire, and we'll start hiring our security guards. And then um, basically that's it really. I don't see the silent protests. I don't quite understand. We've acknowledged it. We didn't know what to do when we first saw it. Now we acknowledge it. Yes, it exists. Yes, it's okay. Um, 
So I actually think we've done what he wanted, you know, that you can do that, acknowledge it and write it. So um, I'm actually okay oh, not overriding it. You know, we just go on like we have and add, have another ordinance and add two little features or override it with a commitment that we will amend it to address the mayor's needs, which I, I think is a productive, normal way of doing legislation rather than pass it, override, go through this shenanigans. But here we are. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Whittleton. Seeing no other members. I do have one last comment. Mr. Constant. Thank you. So uh, I appreciate the argument that the chair can simply make a ruling and the body can overrule it if they don't agree. But time and time again, we have come to understand that the norms of the past are no longer allowable. We have to express, expressly uh, establish and code these rules because these customs are no longer in effect. They've just been wiped away. And so um, the practices from 1975 until 2021 can no longer be assumed to be norms. Second, uh, the argument that we just hire our own security, it in fact may come to that, but I would argue that the preamble of our charter states that we the people of Anchorage in order to eliminate waste and duplication in government, to achieve common goals, to support individual rights, to form a more responsive government, to serve secure maximum local control of local affairs, hereby establish this charter. And so that demands that we learn how to work together, not be at a point where we can't come to agreements on how unified contracts can serve both branches of this government. And so I don't like the idea that we establish a complete and whole separate government branch with all facilities unique to us because the costs, in my opinion, truly work in opposition to the charter and its core principle that we figure out how to do all this without this persistent divide. And I resoundingly support the notion of working together and we can start with our attorneys and we have committees and work sessions and working groups that are our tools to achieve that and I hope that we use them. And with that, again, I support this override. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Seeing no other members in the queue, members may proceed to vote on the motion to override the mayoral veto of AO 2021-117 as amended. Madam Clerk, would you Man, take the vote, please? Madam Chair, I apologize. This is Ms. Allard. I had a family emergency. I'm, I'm actually here. Thank you, Ms. Allard. The clerk um, is recording that you are present, Ms. Allard. Thank you. The motion to override the mayoral veto of AO 2021-117. How do you vote, Mr. Wellton? Yes. Ms. Allard. No. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Rivera. Yes. Ms. Kennedy. No. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Perez Bernia? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. The motion passes nine to two. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next, we have audience participation. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak? If so, please come forward. Seeing no members of the public who wish to speak, we'll move on to assembly comments. And I will start with members on the phone. Ms. Quinn Davidson, any comments? No, thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Quinn Davidson. Ms. Kennedy, any comments? Uh, no further comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Mr. Perez Verdia? No comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Perez Verdia. Mr. Peterson? Thank you, Madam Chair. No comment. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. 
Ms. Zelatel? Thank you, Madam Chair. No comment. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Ms. Zelatel. Ms. Allard? No, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Allard. Mr. Rivera? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess my only comment is, um, you know, if there's any way for Press. us, whoa, <laughs> uh, for us to be able, <laughs> one word, um, to be able to let the public know that, um, sorry, I'm playing around with this, to be able to let the public know that what we did today, I think that would be very helpful because we just got an email a few minutes ago, again, with the no audio thing. So there are members of the public who are very curious to know what we did and they have no clue. So if there's any way that we can let the public know, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Mr. Weddleton? No comment, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weddleton. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Madam Chair, no comment. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Constant? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to take a moment of privilege here and speak to the fact that my best friend's grandmother passed away this morning. A good friend, Randy Gudrun Pollock. We call her Omi. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Very sorry for your loss. I hope you all have a, a nice weekend as well. Thank you all for being here. We are adjourned.